this is the we are recording this uh, webinar and it is for uh, the purposes of uh, getting into the the details the, the, both the basics and some details of this model that is used in the Scott Valley the the name of the model is a bit of a mouthful it's the Scott Valley integrated hydrologic model integrated here meaning that it discusses both it incorporates both groundwater and surface water. And uh, we often call it SWIM for short. So SWIM 101 is what we're uh, going to talk about today. And uh, myself and Leland and Thomas uh, Harder are the modeling team. Um, and we'll be talking today and answering your questions. So we're, we're going to talk about the model itself and also understanding model results and management scenarios in this context. I am going to cover the first three components of this outline. I'm going to go through some basics, and then I'm going to start uh, an introduction to reading and interpreting uh, these results through the lens of some key graphs. I'm then going to use those graphs to talk about model scenarios, what they are, how to use the model to work with scenarios, and discuss stream depletion, something that's important in the groundwater sustainability plan uh, for the Scott Valley. And then we'll we'll briefly touch on a catalog of other scenarios. And then Leland Scandlebury, another member of our team, is going to talk about updates uh, in the model at the end. And then we'll take your questions at the end. So we'll we'll proceed through all the material and then have an hour for questions and answers. So the motivations for developing the Scott Valley Integrated Hydrologic Model or SWIM in the first place uh, were this change in hydrologic regime. And, and broadly water use in the Scott Valley. Um, the difference in average minimum flow between the post 1970s and pre 1970s is uh, roughly the amount of water needed for a third cutting of alfalfa. This reflects the fact, uh, at least one of the changes in the hydrology of the valley is that uh, in the 1970s, increased uh, irrigation efficiency measures led to uh, an expanded use of groundwater and the ability to harvest a third alfalfa cutting. It also coincided with other external factors like changing climate and changing vegetation types in the uplands. So the question here is that in part unforeseen consequences of more efficient irrigation have increased the consumptive use in the valley, it's decreased groundwater recharge, um, and it increases groundwater pumping. Uh, and all of these combine to be a a greater depletion of stream flow. So that's that leads to these lower minimum flows that we've seen in the last few decades relative to the middle part of the, uh, the 20th century, uh, as well as these climatic factors. So the big question we want to ask with SWIM is, can we change management strategies in the basin to improve fish and aquatic habitat while maintaining agricultural production in the valley? These, these twin goals, we're trying to balance them and we're using this model to try to do that. Now, uh, I'm sure everyone who's on this call is aware that the Scott, uh, that Scott Valley um, is located in the Klamath Basin uh, near the border between California and Oregon. The watershed is about 800 square miles. The valley itself is quite a bit smaller than that, more like uh, uh, 77 square miles. If you zoom in on the watershed itself, you can see that uh, the Scott River flows from south to north. It winds through a steep canyon and then joins the Klamath at the far northern um, point of the, of the watershed. There are 12 major tributary streams providing flow to the main stem Scott River. And there are two major irrigation, uh, major diversion ditches that uh, carry water along the eastern side of the valley. And uh, as we can see, most of these tributary streams can come in off the western mountains where there is uh, accumulation of snowpack and uh, higher precipitation. So all of this is, is probably very, very familiar to the folks on this call. The components of the model that we're using um, are three. The first is the upper watershed model. And this is what we use to estimate stream flow entering Scott Valley. It's a linear regression model, so a simple statistical tool. Um, then we use that information to calculate components in the soil water budget model. This is used to estimate recharge and pumping within the valley, and we use a tipping bucket approach. And I'll discuss what that means in a minute. Finally, 
We use that information to run our groundwater surface water model, which provides detailed estimates of groundwater levels and stream flow within the valley. We use a software called ModFlow, uh, written and maintained by the US Geological Survey. Uh, Leland is gonna talk about some of the updates to this modeling software. But let's talk about the first component. We'll walk through each of these pieces in turn. The upper watershed model uh, is based on a statistical regression, and it gets at the problem that we do not have full stream records for all of the tributary streams. The, the data that we do have is often a fairly short record length, and it's patchy. So to cover the full period that we want to simulate, uh, we use the data that we do have, uh, notably the, the long record at the Fort Jones gauge to infer, to statistically estimate what the stream flow is in all the places where there are gaps. And we use them to estimate the inflow at all these green arrows. And it's a fair number of points, but collectively uh, it all makes up inflow to the groundwater model domain. And it does a pretty good job. It, uh, there are obviously discrepancies between some of the estimated flow and some of the observed flow. Um, and in fact, the way that we're going to calculate stream flow in the future is going to change. That's one of the updates. So we won't spend too much time on this, but just to, as a, a, to build confidence in this model, this is, uh, this is one way that we can estimate that. So that is how we estimate this, these tributary flows coming into the model. The second piece is uh, based on our soil water budget. This is used to calculate daily water fluxes at the scale of each field. And this image here on the right is the patchwork of fields of polygons that we use to run these calculations. These don't map exactly onto parcels. Uh, they, are, they are based on more like fields from, from remote sensing. Uh, there's a lot of input data that goes along with, uh, that goes into this budget calculation, including land use cover, the properties of the soil types, the irrigation type on each field, the water source, which is what's shown here in this map, um, the coefficient, the irrigation coefficient of the crops planted on each parcel, as well as the, the precipitation and the stream flow information that we got from the stream flow regression model. It also estimates uh, irrigation from streams and from pumping wells at, at 67 irrigation wells in the model domain. So how does this look calculated daily for each field? Uh, it, the driving force of the soil water budget model is evapotranspiration or ET, which is the total water uh, in vapor phase being transpired by plants or evaporating from the soil. So that is the primary driver driven by atmospheric water demand and the vegetation type on the, on the land cover. The second big component is irrigation. It is assumed that in irrigated and cultivated parcels or polygons, fields, uh, the irrigation is basically has perfect foresight of what the water demand is of the crops. Uh, and this is, this is both from streams and from wells. We're also tracking how much water the plants have access to um, in every day. So this is the soil water content in the soil zone. And then uh, the groundwater recharge is sort of the difference of all of these components. Any water left in the soil volume at the end of each day that's above the field capacity, which is of course based on the soil properties of each field, that is assumed to drain through the soil into the aquifer as groundwater recharge. And that's one of the, that's the principal output for this model, as well as these irrigation calculations. So this, this recharge and the irrigation values are summed by month, and those are fed into the mod flow component of SWIM. So let's talk about that next, uh, this mod flow model. Uh, this is based on the geology of the aquifer, and it is a three-dimensional uh, simulation. Each of these uh, colored areas represent a hydrogeologic zone with different uh, aquifer properties like hydraulic conductivity, uh, which, is which represents how fast water can move through a geologic formation, specific yield, such as how much uh, water that well can produce zoned in that formation. And these are largely based on zones defined by a technical report by Mac in the, in the 1950s. The mod flow model 
uh, in, in addition to simulating groundwater flow, it also routes flow through the streams using this package SFR. And it, um, it, al it also calculates the exchange between the streams and the aquifer underneath it. It also simulates shallow groundwater discharging to the surface in this known area, this sort of hatched zone, which we call the discharge zone, where um, it is, you know, groundwater sort of seeps to the surface and is, is sub-irrigating some fields. The period of time over which we are simulating all this water flowing in and out is a 28 year period, starting October 1st of 1990. So that's the first day of water year 1991 running through uh, the end of water year 2018. Uh, we're using daily time steps so we can produce uh, estimated values uh, on, a, on a daily basis and monthly stress periods. So the flow rates of inputs and outputs are changing monthly. To summarize, what are our take home points here? The structure is these three components, the stream flow regression model, the soil water budget model, and the mod flow. And these three things estimate stream flow in, they estimate a field by field water demand and irrigation, and then they, uh, they use those to run a groundwater surface water model. Key takeaways are that recharge is estimated at the field scale on a daily basis in step two, and groundwater heads, uh, stream flow and stream alpha aquifer exchange are solved together in step three. So those are the basics. Let's talk about reading and interpreting the results. What do model results look like for this model? The short answer is that it looks like data everywhere. Uh, we have about 20,000 aquifer cells using a 100 meter grid to cover the space in Scott Valley. And in 1800 plus of those grid cells, there is a stream uh, crossing that cell in some fashion. And those are called stream reaches. So we have 1800 points along the stream network where we're simulating flow. There's also 336 months in our 28 year model period. Now, these groundwater heads are estimated in each model cell in each month and stream flows are estimated in each stream reach and they're average in each month. In each, in each month. How, how do we begin to sort of subdivide, slice and dice those results in a way that is meaningful for our purposes? You can look at the results in space and time. So looking at groundwater heads in space gives you a contour map. So you could hold time constant. So this is the groundwater elevations for March 2015 and look at them in space. Or you could look at the over time, the heads in one well, it's a well hydrograph. If you wanted to look at stream flows, you could look at them in space, like in these connectivity maps, or look at the flow at one location over time in a river hydrograph. Now, this is still a lot of information. So to, to parse some of this, some of these results, uh, I would argue the key graphs are firstly, the water budget, secondly, the, the flow at the Fort Jones gauge, and then thirdly, various ways to summarize that Fort Jones flow and differences between um, different simulations. So let's walk through these one by one. The key graph one is, is the water budget. What is What does a water budget mean? Um, in this context, for me, it means quantifying the flows in and out of a system. And that is defined by a system boundary over a certain span of time. The system boundary, you know, conceptually could be as small as a single plant or as large as a watershed. And in our case, uh, it is, the, it is the model domain, it's the aquifer and surface water and soil extent of Scott Valley. The rule of thumb here is which arrows are crossing your system boundary. When they cross that boundary, you need a budget term for them. So in a very simple example here, this system represented by this bucket is a watershed and we have precipitation flowing in and river flowing out represented in these two different colors. You would make a budget graph of this very simple two component uh, system with inflow above zero as a positive number and outflow as a negative number. So everything above the zero line is flowing in to our system and everything below it is flowing out. And in this case, these are, these are monthly values. We're gonna look at annual values 
for the rest of these graphs. So for this uh, water budget key graph, we calculate water budget for three different volumes, um, the, the surface water system, the soil zone, and the aquifer. In the surface water system, as you will see, the components are largely dominated by tributary flow into the model and Fort Jones flow out of the model. The light blue here is tributary flow in, the yellow is outflow. Um, there are other colors here on, in the legend of this graph. Each of these bars represents one year, um, but the only one that really registers visually uh, apart from inflow and outflow is stream leakage. And I'll talk about that in a minute. We're also representing the change in water stored in the surface water system, uh, the leakage through the two diversion ditches and overland flow, but none of those are large enough to be, to be visually, you know, uh, you can't see them. The stream leakage is slightly visible, but only in some water years. And that reflects that water year type uh, is a big control on whether or not uh, stream flow is net leaking into the aquifer or whether groundwater is discharging into the streams, which direction that goes. So the soil zone, we're, uh, we're simulating the following inflows and outflows. Our inflows are all coming in from the top. Uh, we're simulating precipitation in, surface water irrigation and groundwater irrigation. We break the irrigation into two components. And then in terms of outflows, we are simulating evapotranspiration out through the top and groundwater recharge percolating through the soil out through the bottom. We're also simulating, we're tracking the change in storage, the amount of water stored in that total soil volume. And when you put those numbers together, you get this bar graph. You can see the zero line in the middle here and all of the blue bars on top, those are our water inputs, rainfall, uh, or precipitation, surface water irrigation, groundwater irrigation. Uh, down below, our outflows are recharge in green and ET in yellow. And uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but it is the case that ET is pretty consistent year to year. The total evapotranspiration, the total water demand in the valley is pretty consistent over each of these 28 years. And the recharge is more variable, uh, which tracks which how, with how much precipitation there is. So the water year type really um, changes the relative values of these inflows and outflows. In the aquifer, our third component, we are simulating the major inflows are groundwater recharge. Uh, so that's calculated in the surface water budget model. It's an input to this aquifer system. We're also simulating lateral flow in from the mountain front. So this mountain front recharge component. As outflows, we're simulating pumping from wells. And there is some evapotranspiration straight from the aquifer in that discharge zone of known, known shallow groundwater, although most of the ET of the model happens in the soil zone. And then there are some uh, drain flow simulating uh, seeps to the surface. In this aquifer budget, we're also simulating leakage from the stream or discharge into the stream. So that arrow can point either direction. We're also tracking the change in storage in the aquifer as well as in the soil. So if you put all those numbers together, you have uh, this zero line is below the red uh, MFR component here. So those inflows are recharge and MFR. The outflows are stream leakage and pumping from wells. In a few years, you do, however, get stream leakage as a net input. Uh, so these are often, uh, yes, this is also dependent on water year type. Wet years will allow uh, a net out, to, the stream leakage to be a net outflow and to provide discharge to this, the stream system. So takeaways from this water budget exercise Surface water system is largely dominated by tributary flow in and river flow out. There's a small uh, portion of surface flow that seeps into the aquifer as stream leakage, although it makes up a bigger part of the aquifer budget. In the soil zone, uh, annual ET is relatively consistent, but irrigation and recharge can vary with water year type. In the aquifer zone, 
uh, our, inlar our inflows are largely the recharge from the soil and recharge from the mountain front, and the outflows are to wells, uh, well pumping, and then discharge to the streams. The stream leakage component links the aquifer and the surface water. It is a small part of the overall surface water budget, but a large part of the aquifer budget. And change in storage is a bigger component in the aquifer budget than in the soil zone. So that's that's one way to think about the water budget. You can ask more detailed questions with more, you can look at things changing by month. So you can break that down in different ways, but we're gonna move on to the Fort Jones flow key gauge. Um, I would argue, I would assume that most people on this call have seen Fort Jones flow over time, but just to set the groundwork here, we're gonna say, we're gonna talk about why the Fort Jones gauge. We'll discuss how we portray this data with a log logarithm y axis and go through some of the questions that you can ask with this graph. We'll then use that information to build into how to use the Fort Jones flow to think about model scenarios um, in terms of simulated versus observed and base case versus scenarios. So the importance of the Fort Jones gauge is manifold. There is a long record length. We have uh, more than eight decades of data. It's a key location downstream of most land and water uses or management in Scott Valley. It is. Uh, it has been historically used for management decisions and it can be used to calibrate our model to judge how good of a job it's doing. Thus, we often summarize the impact of management scenarios in the whole valley in terms of flow changes at Fort Jones gauge. So that is a theme through this whole presentation. But why do we use this log Y axis? To answer that, I decided it's worth uh, putting some lines on some plots. This is the Fort Jones flow hydrograph for water year 2015 with a standard Y axis. You can see it goes up to maybe 12,000 cubic feet per second. Here's the same information with a log Y axis. And if you put lines at 10, 100, 1,000, and 10,000 CFS, you can see that um, they're all kind of clustered together in the standard Y axis, but they really they really spread out with this log Y axis. And it, it gives you more detail at low flows. The, the difference between 1,000 and 1,010 CFS, it doesn't really have, a, have much significance for managers or water users, but the difference between 10 and 20 CFS is greatly significant. So this choice to put everything on a log Y axis is reflecting that. Now we can look at all 80 years of flow observations, although uh, I want to note that the model simulation and swim is only covering the last 30 or so years of that. We do have a lot more information to work with. If we zoom in on those 30 years um, of uh, model period, we can, we can look at the scenarios in the GSP. This range from 91 to 2018. And then in more recent updates, we've been able to expand five years later um, through 2023. And Leland will talk more about that. So one way you can use this graph, Fort Jones flow over time, is you can look at one water year. You can use this to see what type of water year it was. Was the flow very high? Um, if that's sort of more useful if you've seen a lot of these and you know what a wet year looks like. But you could also use it to compare observations against simulation. So if we have simulated versus observed, the observed here is the blue line, the simulated is the dashed black line. You could use it to evaluate how the model did during, for example, the wet season onset here in November, December, the spring flow recession in June, July, and the dry season in September. And so you can start to pick apart different parts of the water year and um, evaluate uh, how the model is performing. But the utility of this graph really breaks down when you're looking at a long time period because we can't see any of those features in, it, it's, it's impossible to see them. So we need to summarize the differences between these two, um, these two time series. So that's where the key graphs three through five come in. Um, so let's let's dig a little deeper here. Simulated versus observed. 
Uh, this is a way to evaluate model performance. The match between observed and simulated is one measure of how well the model is doing. And this is, of course, at you could you could run this analysis at any location, and we've always been using the Fort Jones flow, the Fort Jones location uh, for consistency. So the comparison here is between the observed data and the simulated historical base case, which is SWIM's calibrated estimate of the observed flow. It's been calibrated extensively over multiple rounds of data incorporation. So we're pretty comfortable with this calibrated estimate, although you can still see some differences. You could also see evidence of the monthly time step where the, the sort of, it's a little bit more like a stair step than the observed data, which has those daily flow spikes. Now, if we were to assume that that base case, uh, which is a calibrated estimate, is a close estimate of history, we can take steps further and say, what if history or management had been different over those same 28 years? That's what a scenario is. Then you're making a comparison between the simulated historical base case and a simulated scenario, which is the estimate of the flow if something had changed about the input data for the, this, this model. These are all, these are both simulated, these are both calibrated using historical data, but obviously we only have one history to work with, so we're, we're gazing into a bit of a crystal ball anytime we do these scenario analyses. Now, what, what, can we, what can we use this base case versus scenario analysis for? We can do a lot of the same things we were doing with simulated versus observed. We can compare the management impact during the wet season onset, during the spring flow recession, during the dry season, and, and see how the flow could have been different if management had been different in those 28 years. So, those are, those are two of the key graphs that I wanted to really uh, dig into, and we're gonna proceed uh, to how, how we use them in the model context. Uh, a philosophical question for you, what is a model scenario? If history was different and had different inputs, like the weather or the land cover, how would that change different intermediate calculations like ET and pumping? And how would that change watershed behavior in terms of outputs like heads and flows. When interpreting a model scenario, it's really important to keep in mind what was the motivating question behind its design and what simplifying assumptions do we have to keep in mind when assessing its limitations. As an example, uh, one motivating question that came up during the GSP uh, development period was, what changes in flow would we see if Scott Valley had a reservoir on French Creek? I wouldn't say this is the most likely to be implemented of all the scenarios in the GSP, but it is a handy example. This motivating question came, comes with some simplifying assumptions. In this case, it included, let's make it a 9,000 acre foot inline reservoir. We're not gonna do any feasibility or construction assessments. The reservoir outflow will assume is added directly to the tributary inflow to assess its impact on flows in the rest of the stream system. And then we'll assume a set of reservoir operating rules uh, designed to affect certain management outcomes. And so we can then use this type of graph over perhaps three water years to look at the simulated base case in this dashed black line versus the flow in this scenario. And the answer to this motivating question could be most flow differences occur at the end of the dry season with these operating rules that we have built into the, the reservoir operation here. Now, once again, if we try to look at this over the full model run, which is an important question, you don't wanna just look at what happened in one model year, uh, it becomes very difficult to make any conclusions. So we'll need to summarize those differences in these other types of graphs. So let's do that. Let's try to summarize the difference between the base case and a scenario. Uh, we can focus on some key questions such as, did the flow meet a certain flow regime and how much of the time? To do that, we've designed percentile plots. Secondly, did the scenario improve the timing of fall flows, such as reconnecting the river earlier in the fall? Uh, we have reconnection dates as a graph to discuss that. 
And then in a third question, which I don't, we won't have time to get into in this presentation, um, but I wanted to highlight is available. Did the scenario improve flows in wet average and dry water years? Did, it, did the performance differ by the water year conditions? And so we have a different graph for that type of question. So let's get into these other key graphs. These are all, again, summaries of differences at the Fort Jones gauge of flow. Um, and you can ask them about different, different time series. So in these percentile plots, did the flow meet a certain flow regime is sort of a hard question to answer. So we can break it down into how much of the time was the flow higher than that flow regime? Did the scenario make a difference and when? And basically did scenario flow meet the flow regime more or less than the base case? And to try to answer that, you could look at one water year um, in, uh, in our flow series, such as water year 1991. Or you could start with, you, you could then overplot all of the other years, starting with October 1st. So you start at the beginning of the water year, you run through the end of the water year. We have now put all of the data in one place. So we have, we have effectively uh, summarized the information we want to, you know, ask these questions of, but it's hard to read. So instead, we produce these, uh, this graph, uh, these percentile plots in which this spaghetti of lines is represented in this cleaner uh, collection of uh, shading. So to walk through this percentile plot, the black dotted line, the, excuse me, the black line with the dots in it um, is the median monthly flow. What that means is that the first dot on the left represents the the, the median, the 50th percentile of all the flow rates on all the days in January from 1991 to 2018. Uh, this is the historical observed Fort Jones data. So this is the actual flow record. And so that, you know, half the time the flow was above, what is that, 500 CFS, and half the time it was below it in January. That's how you can read that dot. Um, the the, the probability of the flow being 10 CFS in January is virtually zero. And it's represented by this sort of envelope of shading. So 50% of the time, the flow is in between, say, 1,000 CFS and 200 CFS. And 90% of the time, the flow is in between 3,000 CFS and 80 CFS. So those percentiles are documented in this you know, shape, which obviously represents the wet season, the spring recession, and the dry season in Scott Valley. It's a familiar shape. Um, and that's what those shadings are referring to. Now, we're also adding on top of this various flow regimes that have been proposed for Scott Valley, such as the 2017 in-stream recommended flows in blue in the dashed lines and the 2022 emergency drought flows in the sort of dashed dot in a brownish color. So those two flow regimes are plotted here against all of the flow data. And to summarize that in more human legible terms, um, we have this summary at the bottom where we're focusing on the dry season in September through November of 91 to 2018. The historical flow, the observed data, met or exceeded the 2017 flows on 8% of days and the emergency 2022 flows on 55% of days. And you can see that with the visuals, but it helps to have these uh, verbal summaries. Basically half the time it was, it was doing okay, it was meeting the emergency flows in, the, uh, in this dry season window of September through November, but it was very rarely meeting the other regime plotted on this graph. So that's the historical observed data. We can compare that to the simulated base case and to a, re and to a scenario. So we can take the, the same 28 year time series of Fort Jones flow and make these same percentile graphs. And you will notice slight differences, but largely you know, very similar uh, numbers show up on here. So it starts to matter these details at the bottom. Um, to answer this question, does the observed flow meet this regime? Uh, we can we can also say perhaps in August and September or the two lowest dots on this graph, 
the median observed flow did not meet the 2017 or 2022 flow regime. But in October through December, it, it really, it, the median flow, more than half the time, it's meeting these emergency flows. But in 20, but the 2017 regime is met a lot less of the time. So that's how the historical observed, observed data played out. When you compare it to the simulated historical base case, we can say that SWIM is underpredicting the dry season flow. We have a median flow of 10 CFS compared to 20 CFS in the observed data, um, which is like a big difference in that in that window, but it, it is a, it's still on the same order of magnitude. And especially with this log Y graph um, is in the same ballpark. Uh, it is also simulating a fall flow increase that's slightly steeper than the observed data. So these are all things to account for when discussing model results. Um, but we can safely say both observed and simulated capture the same behavior regarding the two flow regimes pictured here, that they're meeting the 2017 flows on 8% of days and the 2022 emergency flows on 55 to 47% of days. So that's a lot of information about key graph three. We're going to also share a lot of information about this other type of graph before we're done. Uh, this is about reconnection dates. Did the scenario improve the fall time, the timing of fall flows, i.e., did the river reconnect earlier to allow for fish passage to allow for better habitat? Um, one way to look at the fall flows all in the same time, there's so many ways to look at this information, is uh, with this color coded scheme. On the y axis here, we have 91 through 2018. On the x axis, we have all the days in between September 1st and the end of December in those 28 years. Um, and in color coding, we have how high was the flow? It was either below 10 CFS in dark red, it was above 40 CFS in green, and in the middle, we have different gradi gradations 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40. So we can see that in different water year types, the river reconnects quickly or very late, and this has implications for uh, aquatic species. So let's call, for sake of this presentation, river reconnection is the flows hit 40 CFS, CFS at the Fort Jones gauge. You can circle the date on which that happens in a, in a visualization like this, and then you can isolate them, take them out of their yearly context and consider them just a collection of, of dates, of reconnection dates. You can rank them in order, and then you get this sort of swooping curve in which the number of each dot is a year, and the x-axis is which day, September 15th through December 15th, the river reconnected, or in this case, rose above 40 CFS. And on the y-axis, you have the, por the proportion of water years on which that occurred. So you can see that on the first five or six dots here, we have five or six years in which the flow was already uh, at 40 CFS on September 15th. This reconnection either happened really early or it never disconnected at all. Those are the wet water years. Towards the end, you have river is not reconnecting until the end of November or December. Those are dry water years. And um, in this graph, in the perfect world, we would like all of the dots to line up on the left side of the graph. That would mean that all water years reconnected early. Uh, so the question, did the scenario improve the timing of fall flows in terms of earlier river reconnection? Um, in this example of comparing the base case to two scenarios, they did that because the, the distribution of reconnection dates has shifted up and to the left. So in this case, we're, we're pulling as our example, crops that consume less water can improve collective stream reconnection dates. And you can, you can estimate that uh, in terms of number of days on this graph. So it can be like a week to three weeks earlier, collectively. Now we could also use the same graph to ask questions about model performance regarding timing of fall flows. The uh, model historical base case, which is here again in gray, is, is a bit more pessimistic about fall flows than the observed data. And in aggregate, in normal or average water years, it reconnects one to four weeks later than the actual flows that we observe. So this, there is some reason for caution in, in observing and in interpreting some of these results, but 
it is this uh, valuable tool for asking more detailed questions about this narrow uh, fall window. So getting into the meat of it here, I think I'm, I'm running a little short on time, but I will try to talk about stream depletion. Um, so stream depletion was an important part of the groundwater sustainability plan development. And the question, how much stream depletion has happened is very difficult to answer uh, and very hard to measure in any case. So we can rephrase it to be, how would flow have been higher if there were no agriculture or no agricultural pumping or no agricultural pumping in the areas of Scott Valley under the jurisdiction of SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And in that phrasing, those are just what if questions that we can use to build a scenario. So we can run scenarios as if management were different to see or estimate how much stream depletion has occurred. And this can be quantified as the difference in flow at the Fort Jones gauge over these 28 years between the base case and a no pumping reference scenario. We have various ways of visualizing the stream depletion and a lot of them are, um, they're all in terms of these Fort Jones flow, so they're familiar in that sense, but um, it's a lot of information at once. Total stream depletion in the groundwater sustainability plan is quantified as the difference in flow at the Fort Jones gauge over the model period between the base case and the no pumping reference case, which is due to pumping in sigma wells. And this is also uh, assumed and referred to as natural vegetation on groundwater and mixed source fields outside the adjudicated zone, which is a lot of a big mouthful, but it sort of reflects the sigma jurisdiction and the agriculture that would be affected. Um, now, this total depletion calculated for the GSP can be visualized in terms of the difference between two sets of lines. And each of these lines represents the average monthly flow in a different water year, a dry and average in a wet water year. So that difference between those lines uh, is how much depletion is due to those factors. So total depletion is this arrow going down between the no pumping reference case and the base case. Conversely, you can calculate how much depletion reversal a management scenario could affect by basically making an arrow going back the other way. So total depletion is between the uh, base case and the no pumping reference scenario. And the depletion reversal is between the base case and the management scenario. So you need these three components to estimate the positive impact of a management scenario on stream depletion. I think we might leave it mostly at that. You can think of this in space in terms of land use changes between the base case and this attribution scenario to figure out what if history had been different. You can look, you can zoom in on these narrow windows to find the shaded areas under each curve. Um, we, I don't have to go into these details. These are in the GSP. And you can also represent these in percentile plots and reconnection dates. So if all agriculture had been replaced by native vegetation for those 28 years, fall flows would nearly always meet some of the, this 2022 regime, and it would meet the 2017 regime on 41% of days. That is one summary you can pull out of this type of plot. If we use the more appropriate uh, no pumping reference case in sigma pumping wells, it would be more like it would meet the emergency drought regime on 80% of days and the 2017 regime on 18% of days. This reconnection date would also show some differences between the base case and our various set of stream depletion estimation scenarios. So roughly we can say stream depletion accounts for about a month of later river reconnection. So to summarize here, we can use this model to estimate stream depletion due to pumping in sigma wells or all water use or any sort of combination of areas and water use types that we choose to draft a model scenario for by simulating native vegetation that is not irrigated in the place of some irrigated agriculture and seeing how that affects the water budget and the groundwater heads and the flows. Right, and we need two scenarios to calculate stream depletion and a third scenario, a management action scenario to calculate the reversal. And they can be summarized in a variety of ways as we just mentioned. So um, to save time, I'm just going to refer 
to the catalog of scenarios in the GSP, which has been updated as an appendix to a report on uh, UC Davis's or Thomas Harder's groundwater website. Those are those are here. The full we we sort of referenced a number of the scenarios in this discussion. Um, a reservoir, different irrigation types, um, just different land use types, and a lot more information is in these reports. And with that, I'll hand it off to Leland. And then we'll take questions at the end. Thanks, Claire. We you know we actually have until five, but <laughs> if we end early, I guess that's all right. All right. Uh, so I will share my screen. And hopefully you see that now. Cool. All right. So I'm going to be talking about kind of uh, ongoing updates to the model and some of the research I'm doing to try to support this modeling work. Uh, I can advance slide. So here's Scott Valley and all its majesty. If those hills look a little larger than you're used to, for those of you who live out there, there's a double uh, doubling of the vertical uh, exaggeration here. So the, it's a little taller. But uh, here's kind of our model that goes throughout the whole valley. You can see the stream system. And uh, if you look really closely, hopefully you can see the grid that's there. And uh, a lot of the predictions we make, as you probably saw from Claire's graphs, really relate to this Fort Jones gauge. You know, that's because it's our, our main data source. And what's great about stream flow data is that it's it's the summary of all the things that happen in the valley, uh, that the water funnels down into this river system, uh, either through the river or through the aquifer, and ends up all at this point. And uh, it's it's a really good way of kind of, you know, checking this, this volume of water leaving the whole area. But it doesn't give you a lot about kind of the, the spatial distribution of things going on, the different processes that happen throughout the watershed. So if I were to try to sum up everything that I'm really working on, uh, it's trying to incorporate a few new data sources to really improve our predictions throughout the valley. Uh, and I, I don't know if they will necessarily improve our ability to uh, predict the Fort Jones gauge, which actually is quite good at the moment, um, but they may help us uh, make the model more accurate in general or represent things a little more accurately. So. One of the main ones is, uh, Claire showed this earlier. Here, let me try to get a little uh, laser pointer going. Showed this figure earlier. This is of all the different inflows into the valley. Uh, and currently, right now, we're, we're handling that with a stream flow regression. And so that's a statistical model that kind of uh, uses the actual uh, flow out of Fort Jones to predict all these inflows. Uh, and we've tried to move on from that, both both one because you're really not supposed to use your your output as your input to a model, and and two to try to get you know all the scenarios that we run for the model. It would be great if we were able to kind of run scenarios also with a uh, model of these different stream flows coming into the system. And to do that, we're using something called PRMS, it's another USGS product, the precipitation routing modeling system. I hope I got that acronym right. Uh, and it's actually, the model itself is being built by uh, Larry Walker and Associates. Uh, but uh, this is kind of a nice little cartoon showing all the different things it kind of takes into account, including groundwater itself and all, uh, a bunch of other things to try to get at the stream flow. And so it's a, a larger model of the whole watershed area and it allows us to predict uh, all these flows coming in. So that's been a big update. Uh, I, I did want to mention uh, that it actually, so it's a daily model and we've updated the soil water budget model so that it runs on a daily schedule as well. Um, and so it can actually route water into the, the mod flow model uh, on a daily basis using uh, the SFR packages tab files for those of you who are mod flow nerds in the audience. Um, and actually, this is reminding me, I'm looking at my notes. I did want to mention, because Claire brought it up and I, I don't have a slide about it. We, one of the big things we did for the model is we changed it so that it can be updated every month. So we have an automatic script that can run. It downloads all the input data for uh, the whole model and, and, and outputs those uh, files so that you can run it up to the last month. So that's kind of a neat new feature. Uh, 
So here's the uh, PRMS. This isn't the whole PRMS model, but this is kind of the main Scott Valley watershed model of everything that ends up out at the Fort Jones gauge. Uh, and this is the elevation plotted in each one of these little catchments. Uh, and so you can see within each one of these areas, you know, you can imagine rain falling and then it kind of gets uh, funneled into these little areas that are purplish where there's rivers and flows down into here. And so it's just modeling all of that. Uh, but what's kind of cool is if you look back at the cartoon here, uh, since it does model recharge, we're, we're hoping to get out of this in addition to the rivers, uh, the, the small streams coming in is actually get an estimate of the amount of recharge coming through at all these different sides. So if we imagine this little uh, catchment here, you know, all the water falling on the sill side, uh, we want to know how much of that actually ends up uh, sending water through the ground into our valley. And we're kind of working on a method for, for incorporating that right now. Uh, moving on to one of the kind of main things I've been working on, I've been looking at getting these um, DWRs, been doing all these great airborne electromagnetic surveys throughout uh, California, and I'll kind of talk about what those means. And, and luckily for us, Scott Valley is one such uh, basin that they've been including. So we have some nice uh, new data to look at. So. These surveys, uh, they run these, well, it's a geophysical method measuring electromagnetic response of subsurface materials. So we got a helicopter over here and it has this big loop on the bottom and it flies over. And as it flies over the land, a pulse of electricity goes through this loop and that uh, creates a little electric signal in the subsurface and which creates another subsurface uh, response signal that comes out and that's measured in another loop contained inside this first loop. And so by measuring that, we get a response that's not just related to the subsurface materials, which is what we're looking for, but it's also related to water content and the salinity and water quality. And so uh, in this case, we're really interested in this what, what's underground sort of question, uh, but uh, it's important to realize that this is also picking up uh, how much water is underground, where there is water, and uh, what is the quality of that water. And so you'll see people using the same sort of uh, data to try to get at these two questions. Uh, in this case, we're more interested in this one with some of this one built in. Uh, but you can't easily separate out without a lot of data which one of these signals you're getting. So it's all one thing at once. You're trying to kind of decompose it. So after cleaning, this uh, response can be inverted to obtain 2D models of resistivity up to 300 meters or 1,000 feet deep. So it's pretty good for Scott Valley in terms of what we would like for our model. Uh, here's a nice little graphic. Here's Scott Valley again. You can see the river in blue. And in black are where they flew the helicopter uh, and picked up this AEM survey. And then I'm also showing here these uh, borehole logs. So these are different places that maybe someone's doing well for whatever reason, we have some sort of idea of what's underground. And so there's high quality borehole logs, which means that they are, uh, ah, man, I think it's maybe 30 meters deep, 30 feet deep, I'm, I'm forgetting now. But their, their location is also very well known in space. That's one of the key ideas of what this high quality data means. Whereas the gray ones, we might only know what township range and section they are in. So it's a little bit more of an approximate location. Uh, and the hope is to use these data to help us figure out what these survey uh, uh, resistivity lines are telling us. So how do we use these AEM survey results in the groundwater surface water model? Uh, hopefully by comparing those, we get something interesting. So um, one method we've been using is from Knight et al. It's a paper out of Stanford from Rosemary Knight's lab. And they did kind of a cool thing where for each one of these AM, they're calling them pixels, but it's like just a discrete unit underground where you have this, this uh, resistivity response of the AM data. You line it up against one of these close logs to it, and you kind of treat this as a uh, electrical circuit. If you imagine each one of these different textures under here being their own resistor. And so the resistance of these as a circuit in series should be equal to the resistance of this uh, AEM uh, 
data that we have or model that we have observed. So uh, by setting this up as a series of equations, doing some math, and kind of get these cool distributions. And so basically, here's the resistivity that you might measure using the AEM. And then here's what texture we think it is, having compared it to the logs. So clay mixed being a mix of clay and coarse materials. This one over here is coarse, and here's very coarse. Uh, this is subject to change, this, this very specific uh, distribution I, I created. Um, but this is what we've been kind of working with recently. So. If you take one of these flight lines, so here's one of them over here, and this is, you know, with depth and then along the side here, starting from here, uh, you can kind of see there's really high resistance uh, in the data set for Scott Valley. And then there's these two black lines, and those are the depth of investigation kind of uh, measured two different ways. And that's basically the depth at which we just, oh, we don't really trust the data anymore. It's It's not easy to interpret the signal, try to get down lower than that. And it didn't really give us anything interesting back. So, uh, but what you can do is using these uh, resistivity texture relationships that we have come up with for Scott Valley specifically, and then you can kind of categorize uh, the resistivity up here. And so you can break it apart into clay, mixed, coarse, and very coarse. Uh, and for, Anyone out there trying trying to work with this data? One of the things that is really difficult is that, uh, so you can see there's really high resistivities down here, both below the depth of investigation and a little bit above. And you know, we're pretty sure it's actually bedrock that we're looking at is the bottom here, but it shows up in our relationships as very coarse, and it's just because the the rock is is indistinguishable from from big cobbles, um, the solid rock. And so one of the difficulties kind of working with this. Uh, here is just kind of taking that survey data and just um, the most likely texture. It's using the same colors from the previous slides. And, and this is just the most probable texture. So we can actually get a probability using these relationships for each one of these. You know, it's like less likely to be one of these down here. It's very likely to get be one of these up here. Uh, but the idea is to kind of be able to interpret this to the grid using all of the texture data we have as well for the valley. So of all those different uh, portholes kind of incorporating what, what they tell us is underground. And so that's what I've been working on. And that's going to be a big update because currently right now, as Claire showed, we're using this uh, distribution of materials kind of based off of a 1958 USGS report. It just kind of gives us this very coarse idea. This is a much more data-driven way of kind of getting at that. So moving on to something a little further down the road, uh, one of the things I'm looking at is trying to incorporate remote sensed water presence data. And this obviously is not Scott Valley, but this is just kind of the idea. And this is my inspiration. You see some of these graphics where people take satellite images. We call that remote sensing. And uh, they pull out where there's water. And there's often a big question in Scott Valley of where there's water <laughs> and when. So, uh, here's from uh, Tolley et al. 2019, which is the paper kind of talking about the calibration of the current Scott Valley model. And one of the things they looked at is kind of as validation is uh, when is the model right about where there's water in the stream system? So blue is if it matches that there's flowing water. This red-ish color is it's uh, matching that it's dry. And uh, orange is that there's like a disagreement. And so the green gray color is also disagreement. This is no data. As you can see in general, I mean, the model isn't full. It's it's mostly this this red and the blue. So it's it's been pretty accurate about this. But getting that, that perfect timing right about when the river disconnects and reconnects and where is, is both an important uh, question that we'd like to ask the model and just like a really useful data source for understanding this system. So my hope is what, what can we get from this remote sensing data? So I'm hoping we can get uh, embedded in that, that remote sensing data is the location and timing of stream desk or in, in, <laughs> embedded in that information about the location and timing of the stream disconnection. We can get how much water is in the river, the groundwater level at the aquifer below, 
and the connection between the stream and the aquifer. So it doesn't give that directly, but that's kind of what are the different things controlling that. Uh, and it would be a really important model capability for running scenarios to see how different management actions like manage aquifer recharge can help keep the stream connected. So the big idea is if we can get the model to be a really good predictor of these uh, reconnection and disconnection dates and timing, uh, then it, when we run scenarios to try to keep water in the river using different things, it, it tells us something real about how that can change the timing of those connections and disconnections. Uh, quick remote sensing basics here. So this is uh, different wavelengths uh, of light, uh, visible and not. And so you can see water is just this little bump over here. These are in gray are different bands you can get out of different satellites. So there's just kind of discrete units of wavelengths that they kind of offer. Uh, they can get from these uh, photos, if you will, that they, they allow you to download online. And we live in kind of an era where this is increasingly just like a really easy data source to get. So the European Space Agency runs two satellites called Sentinel-2 that orbit pretty often and collect data. Uh, and then there's also commercial companies that do this. One of them is Planet, and we've been trying to work with them. And they uh, have uh, really high resolution data, both in terms of the, the photos are um, the pixels are very small, the size. You can really pick up on things like narrow streams connecting and having water. Uh, in addition to, you know, there's data like almost every day or every other day. So really useful stuff, but it does cost money. Um, and obviously the kind of method I'm, I'm proposing here where you're able to use this data to figure out new things about your system only works in the stream where the, the river connects and disconnects. Uh, and by that, I mean, you know, it goes dry in certain sections. If the river just had water all the time, that isn't telling you anything useful when you try to look at this data. Uh, there's no connection and disconnection. So a quick survey of some of the methods. Uh, old paper, uh, normalized difference water index. It just kind of uses those different satellite bands that you can uh, get from this, these images uh, and tries to figure out where there's water. Someone updated that, the modified NDWI, and someone updated that, the augmented NWDI. But what we've really seen a lot more lately is people using machine learning methods like random forests or neural networks, kind of combining all of these different things. You know, they're just like, ah, heck, we can just put anything into it. So we'll use the NDWI and these other ones and all the different bands available to us and any data we have, and just put that into the, the network or uh, the random forest and, and get this good predictor. And so lucky for us in Scott Valley, as some of you know, uh, there actually are people every week who go out and uh, collect information about where in the system the stream is connected. They go take uh, pictures of the different bridges. And so we can actually use that as training data for our machine learning methods uh, and also to uh, estimate the error of whatever kind of model we build to figure out when the river is disconnected and connected. So that's really useful. Um, here's just a quick example. Big thanks to Vexon Vexanov, who's my intern, who's been <laughs> really doing most of the work on this. I just kind of advise him and check in and see what amazing thing he's done in the past week. And that's just an image from August 17th, 2023. You can see there's water. It kind of detects here in the main Scott uh, River. And then Etna over here is fairly dry. So... I don't know if we checked that against the data, but <laughs> that's what he was picking up. Um, yeah, and so that's that's something we hope to kind of help improve the model. All right, that's all I had. So that's the the main swim updates. Uh, thank you guys. Great, thank you, Leland and Claire. That was a that was a great overview. Um, so as we move into the questions. Um, I do want to encourage folks to use the Q&A to type out their question and send it. I also want to flag that by clicking on that, you're able to see questions that were asked and answered throughout the presentation. So you're also able to check and see if maybe your question was answered in there. Um, if for some reason your question is a little bit difficult or you prefer to just uh, do an oral ask, um, please raise your hand and we could go ahead and also call on folks that way as well.
Um, so for Claire and Leland, do you prefer I just kind of call on, on app, uh, attendees who have their hands raised or would you like to be the ones who do it? Um, I think I think Craig and Udita have had their hands up for a while. So maybe let's go to them first. I, I we, we can call on them, I, I think, unless you unless you would prefer to moderate. No, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, you, okay. you got it. OK, I'm not sure who was first, but it seems that. Yeah, OK, go for it, Craig. Well, I'm just trying to better understand, you know, what we can do with the model. I think, I mean, I understand you, you must be giving a year by year input on the historic land use, which I guess there's some variability over time and year to year. But if we are contemplating things like, you know, adding a bunch of beaver ponds or reconnecting a bunch of floodplain, can, are those kinds of big changes, uh, something that can be modeled using the model this way? Thomas, it looks like you unmuted. Do you want to take the first crack at this? Oh, oh no, I'll let Leland or you take a first crack okay. at this. All right. Um, I think the two things that you mentioned, uh, beaver ponds and floodplain reconnection are I, I would say beaver ponds, we have we have done preliminary testing of seeing if we can implement that in the model. And I, I'm not confident that it's set up to simulate it terribly well. The the floodplain reconnection we haven't tried. In the case of the beaver ponds, um, our struggle is with the grid cell size, which is 100 meters by 100 meters. And so the representation of any surface water body um, is sort of limited to that length and width and beaver ponds are often much smaller than that so i think you can change the elevation of the stream bed as a proxy for a beaver pond but there's there's some there's some challenges in just like the physical discretization of the model that goes pretty deep in the model architecture that make those that a hard question to answer when we did try to alter the stream bed elevation to sort of represent widespread um, beaver dams like just raising raising the elevation of the stream it, um, I, I'm not sure it fully captured the dynamics. It sort of changed the performance in the first year, and then the, the system sort of proceeded in the same way as the historical base case. It basically didn't make a difference after that initial extra volume was filled up. Um, so I think there are, there are some questions that it is not well suited to answer, and beaver dams may be one of them. The, the floodplain reconnection would involve like changing the elevation of different model cells. And we could certainly do that, but it would have to be, we only use one set of elevation data for the full model period. That, that I, don't, I don't think we currently have a capacity to change it over time. So it would be, what if the elevation of different floodplain areas were different for all 28 years? And um, yeah, that would certainly be possible. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't looked into it though. We've only used the same set of SERP elevations. Yeah, in in my um, earlier written answer to your question, Craig, um, I I already pointed out that, and sort of what Claire just confirmed is we have a fairly crude representation at the small scale, sort of, sort of at the scale of this image that you're looking at, of the river um, within that hundred meter by hundred meter cell. We know how what length the river has within that cell. That's part of the model. We know what the average width is in that cell. And moreover, we use the same average width basically across each stream's entire length. We don't we don't vary it. Um, we don't have a very detailed cross-section of the river per se. Um, and that comes from um, our initial attempt to create a watershed model and, and a larger scale model and get sort of the larger elements correct. And this may be the time um, where we start to bifurcate and in fact, start to dive into some more local scale improvements, at least try it in a few parts of the valley where we might sort of zoom in with the model and see what or get a better representation of the stream cross sections. And Sarah, with her question on channel com or, or her comment on channel composition having 
lot of impact on functional flow and ecological use. Um, um, that will be a task that's ahead of us to try to see whether we can put more of that into the model and what are, that makes a difference in our understanding and how the model actually simulates that. Um, and the beaver dams is, is sort of one of the next ones to take a crack at. Um, getting to floodplains and actually changing the land surface or getting to the more the, the details of uh, more local scale cross sections uh, would be sort of one step behind that. Those are bigger changes to the model that would require also um, uh, much further sort of eradication of, of data on stream cross sections, et cetera. We do have actually quite a bit of data from LIDAR measurements that have been taken in the past um, off, of, off of helicopters. Um, they are very detailed land surface representations, but as you can see in this picture, the surface of the land isn't necessarily the land itself. Uh, the LIDAR uh, picture would pick up the surface of these trees as the land surface, not the surface of the land, uh, depending on on how it works. I would I would second this. I think a way to think about this regional scale model is that it's getting the big picture as right as it can, and it's we are calibrating that based on groundwater heads and flows um, across the valley. But if you try to ask about any one particular model grid cell or one some one particular well or one particular stream reach. I, I would have lower confidence in that specific spot representing those fine dynamics is another way to think about it. Okay, I think we had, Thomas, I think that answered Sarah's comment. Yeah, um, next and Sarah, from, feel free to chime in again. Yeah, for sure, if we did not sufficiently answer that. Um, Eli's question here, uh, incorporating winter stock water diversions it, it remains the same. We have a uh, similarly a rough representation of it in terms of we know that water leaks from the ditches into the groundwater, and that is represented in the model, but as a a, a fairly static value. Um, dynamic winter stock water diversions are not currently um, represented. And as far as I know, where 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 I last interacted with that, there was really not not enough data to try to to you know, put together a full time series of winter stock water diversions uh, as a as a model input. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Eli. Go ahead, Eli. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yes. So even if there's not something time that's time dynamic, it seems like like. Right now, basically, once irrigation season ends and there's no ET demand, there isn't any water in the ditches in the model, right? It's just totally turned off. And so it seems to me that, yes, I agree, it's it's really hard to know what is the, 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 the best way or the most accurate way to do it. But it seems like having something in there would be better than having nothing. Like if we just pick some average, like, you know, a certain percentage of flow from the creeks or up to the capacity of the ditches or something like that. Yeah, no, that, I mean, you may have better information. Ahead, and Eli, is your sense, I, th I mean, th this would be worth um, probably a separate discussion, but maybe for, for the broader audience, you can also share a little bit more about what your sense is of the hydrologic impact of start water diversions other than the immediate impact on stream flow is the, I'm thinking you have the, the impact on stream in stream flow. You have additional leakage out of ditches that are used for stock water use. And then you have the consumptive, you have both the consumptive use and the non-consumptive use of that stock water um, by livestock. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think my sense would be that um, I wouldn't worry that much about the consumptive use in the stock water because it's pretty low, but the yeah diversions from the streams and then the recharge I think uh, those two things. Okay. And there's I think there's probably some shouldn't there be, I mean I don't know these numbers but uh, conceivably somebody knows approximately 
how many cows are on each ranch or something like that. Um, do, you, like every... do you happen to know if it all sort of reaches the end of the ditch and then it's all seeping into the ground or if there's a lot of water coming off the end of the ditch back into the river? I'm I'm not the right person to answer that. I've you know I've just driven around a little bit in the winter and seen it, but um, okay. second second hand knowledge. So I, I would def totally defer to the to the locals on that. But I have heard that a lot of the ditches are relatively full through most of the winter, as long as there's water in the creeks to feed them. Mm -hmm. So it just seems like an important thing to to put into the model because. I don't know how else we get <laughs> answers think, on how important it is hydrologically if it's not in the model. Right. And, you know, that's that's so. totally fair. I think we also may have a spatial data constraint where I think we currently only have two ditches, um, right? And we, there, I'm sure there are more for stock water. So, yeah. But yeah, I, I think that's that's definitely a worthy topic of continued discussion. Yeah, and yeah, if you guys we, or, or get around to that, I'd be interested to talk about talk about that more. Certainly. Um, are we good to move on to the next question? Um, so Craig is asking about model outputs for various runs that we've already performed. The best catalog of that is at the end of the GSP. Um, it's called Appendix 4A, the scenario model results. And the updated version of that is um, in, a, in a report that Thomas just finalized. Um, and those links are in the slide and I can paste them into the answer to your question. Um, but that it, it's sort of a catalog. It's like a compendium and it, it walks, it, it includes basically the same graphs that we talked about in the presentation today for every single scenario that we ran for the GSP. Um, and I will retrieve that and put it in there. And in the, in that report, uh, wh where that report is really different from what's in the GSP is that we have tried to actually describe some of the key outcomes from these different modeling scenarios. There's a section on the climate scenarios and the outcomes from those. There's a section on the native vegetation or, or no irrigation scenarios, the attribution scenarios. And then there's a section on the management scenarios and each of them describes um, sort of in, 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 in general terms, what we're finding from these scenarios. And then the appendices have all of the um, graphs that in, in a summer, summary form sort of capture the key outcomes from these different scenarios. And I guess then there's a question from Mortesa to me in terms of whether I've seen any limitations and errors due to the simple video zone formulation that is in the model and um, sort of explaining that question perhaps to, to, the, to the broader audience. The soil water budget model that Claire described is based on as she, as she pointed out, we're doing a water budget on a field by field basis. And the way we do that is we, we basically assume that each field is a, is a box uh, and it's a, it's a soil box that has a certain thickness, either four feet or eight feet, and it has a certain water holding capacity, the, a certain amount of water depth that that box can hold against gravity at the end of the day. And anything that's above that depth will become recharge at the end of the day. And, and for the day before it makes that decision on whether some recharge occurs or not, um, it kind of adds the precipitation into the box. It adds the irrigation into the box. Uh, it subtracts the evapotranspiration out of the box for that day. And then it looks at, okay, so where are we now in the water content of the box? And is that above the water holding capacity or not? Um, it's what we call a tipping bucket representation of the unsaturated zone. It's, um, and, and it's one that's purely based on this water, water balance idea. It's, um, there is more physically based ways to deal with that bit of zone using, a, uh, using essentially a flow equation for that soil box and for the underlying deeper unsaturated zone. 
Um, and um, there are models that do that. Um, the reason why we haven't used those is much the same reason that the same those haven't been used in the, in the past, at least um, uh, in some of the larger scale models, uh, for example, in the Central Valley. Our formulation of the salt water budget model is essentially based off of earlier versions of uh, DWR's integrated water flow model, which is the underlying software underneath the Central Valley C2B SIM model. Um, and for the longer term, it, um, that water balance approach provides a fairly good description of what recharge occurs um, and of the, uh, da the water dynamics in the root zone. Um, we weren't interested in necessarily figuring out what happens day to day or week to week. We were mostly interested in capturing monthly recharge and monthly pumping amounts needed to do the irrigation. We have not done any comparison for Scott Valley between different models. Um, we had an intern a couple of years back that ran hydro simulations. Um, and we may get back into that uh, to see whether we get much different results. Um, but I, it, I don't really have a good sense. Um, the, well, the best sense I have of the differences that may there may, may be there come based on work that Farak Batras has done in my group about 10 years ago looking at a site in the Central Valley where we have 50 feet to groundwater and where he compared a number of different approaches to looking at flow through the unsaturated zone and sort of a basic tipping bucket approach or water mass balance approach seemed to work over the long term uh, as well as any of the other approaches. Um, so that's something that we can definitely still look at. Claire, did you look at the next question or Leland? Is that something for that either one of you could answer? Sure, I'm I'm actually responding to a, a data offer from Dustin in the chat. Um, I'm just putting my email in there so we can get in contact with Dustin about this data source. Um, yeah, Shahab's on it. Okay, uh, next question. Some questions are raised the fall workshops about the model's assumptions about irrigation application amounts. Will any model runs be able to look at higher or lower assumptions of variation per acre? Um, this was this was not asked before. So there has been one scenario run in the catalog of them for the GSP in which we test. Okay, it's like two or three, but it's it's testing irrigation efficiencies two that are higher and one that is lower. So that would be two less water and one more water, but it's pretty small differences. And the ultimate difference it made in terms of flow was fairly small. Um, so I, we have not done things like what if flood irrigation made a big comeback or something. Um, but uh, you might you might be able to start from there with those irrigation efficiency scenarios um, in that catalog. But we'd be I'd be open to other suggestions for how to parameterize that. And then maybe Leland, you can take on Craig's question about whether anyone with mod flow experience can run the model. Yeah, thanks for the question, Craig. Uh, I'd say technically you don't need mod flow experience to run the model. We have a GitHub page, which uh, I'm happy to send you, Craig. You can also just maybe maybe I'll just commit to sending it to you. And uh, you should just be able to to download everything on there and follow the instructions on that GitHub page and and run the model. Um, but where the mod flow experience becomes important is when you're kind of messing around with the scenarios. And, and we're trying to make it a lot easier for people to kind of interact with the model and, and kind of run these scenarios. Um, but it's a substantial amount of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work for us to get them going. So try to make it easier. Uh, we're, we're doing our best. But yeah, the idea is it should be something that anyone can grab and kind of play with. And uh, uh, luckily, you have access to me. And so if you have trouble with the model, or if you have a model flow model or working with model and they have trouble, feel free to send me questions. I'm happy to work with you or them. 
yeah, the, the number of input files to, to work with can can become a lot uh, pretty quickly with some of these uh, scenario designs. But yeah, it's definitely definitely something we want more people to have access to. Do we want to go back to Eli? Do we have any other? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, go go for it. Eli, go for it. OK, <laughs> so I had some questions on the um, on the surface water hydrology model for the tributaries that you all are working on, the PRMS. Um, I think what the map that Leland showed, did that show, um, I think they're called the hydrologic response units or, or sort of the little the watersheds um, for the PRMS, they were like orange, orange boundaries. Um, no, and, actually, it actually works on the, the same 100 by 100 meter grid as the oh, okay, uh, rod flow model. Yeah, okay, so great, it's actually was, very refined, yeah. Okay, because I was looking at it and I was like, hmm, I don't know, one polygon stretching for a whole tributary from the valley floor to the top of the mountain might not be that good for me. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the catch okay, means I actually divided right. up just because I want to be able to use those. You know, like all the the recharge in that area would be routed into the model. That was kind gotcha. of, I was trying yeah. to move the next scale up. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, so that's that's good. Um, the other question I had was, how do you go about, or I guess, what are the methods for calibrating that surface hydrology model? Because almost all of the gauges um, have diversions, right? And so, uh, but so I guess. What what's the technique for that, and and sort of what what stage is that? Is like, would you call the the calibration completed or in progress, or what's the? I, Larry Walker and Associates is the main kind of you know person handling that. So mm -hmm. I, I'm a little scared talking too much for them, but okay. we, we've been playing with the model. I have a version of it. And it, so it's been calibrated. And I think they're kind of redoing the calibration a little bit and still playing with it. So I don't know if I'd say it's done, but it's it's maybe closer to, to the done end of okay. things. Yeah, um, I, if, it's, if it's possible, I would be interested in just sort of get, take, being able to take a look at the outputs for some of the tributaries, especially the ones that have um, have gauges. I don't know if that's a possibility or not. Yeah, but you're, you're definitely right that there's this kind of uh, difficult situation where there's an unknown amount of water removed from, from the gauge data. Uh, and so we, we do use for where we can, the places in the soil water budget model does predict pumping at those locations and take water out of there. And mm -hmm. so we've been providing those as an input to Larry Walker and Associates for them to kind of uh, add that amount of water on and, and try to get it all to balance. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure how they've been handling that specifically, right. but that is something we've been giving them. Okay, great. Um, and then my, my last question on the surface water hydrology model would be, how sensitive is you, you know, this overall, um, the, the, the combined uh, SVIM model, how, how sensitive it, is it to um, the summer low flow in tributaries? Because, you know, no matter how, <laughs> no matter what method you're using to estimate those tributary flows, whether it was the, you know, the older uh, regression model or the new uh, surface water hydrology PRMS model, predicting things in you know in August at the lowest flow time of year is is difficult no matter how you do it. Uh, so it's probably going to be you know just some decent amount of air in there that's just un unavoidable, right? Um, but my question is like how I think it would be really great to do some kind of sensitivity analysis in the model to to see like okay, well let's say we don't really know whether the tributary inflow in August is, you know, 50 CFS or 25 CFS, something like that, right? Does that matter for the flow at, at that time of year? Or is really the only thing is important is the amount of water that comes into the valley in, you know, March, April, May, June, and then whatever's coming in August, it just really doesn't, doesn't matter. Is there any, I guess I would, I assume there's not a current plan to do that um, sensitivity analysis, but I, I would encourage that to be done. Just like double the tributary flow, you know, during the lowest flow season, just for a few months, and just see like, well, does it affect the outflows at all at the, at the end of the valley? I don't know how hard or not that would be to do, but I don't know. Any thoughts on that? 
we have gone sort of sideways at that question with one very extreme reservoir scenario that sort of uh, invented magic water and mm -hmm. put it in the stream. And uh -huh. I think it made the most difference during the reconnection period, which sort of in, conceptually in my mind was like, well, how full the bucket is when it starts receiving the water in the rainy season determines how fast it will reconnect and start flowing in earnest again. So that it, it like might not have made a big difference in the flows at the end of the valley um, in the during the dry season, but it may have changed the timing of when it reconnected. So that's that's one very off the cuff answer. I don't know if that's how it would play out in a sensitivity analysis, but um, that is one way of looking at it. I do think um, Gus, uh, a, a former a, a former student here who was also on the technical team, was uh, included did a like a large scale sensitivity analysis, and that's included in the. Um, I think I saw his paper linked in the answer to a question or two. Um, he weighted, he uh, assigned a higher weight to the um, low flows in that sensitivity analysis and that calibration for the model that we we're using in the GSP. So some of what you're saying has been done, um, but I don't think it was as specific as what you're describing. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I remember looking at the different parameters that were in the sensitivity analysis and I yeah, I, I at least as well as I could understand them, which is not real well. <laughs> um, it didn't. Yeah, it didn't look like there was a specific like trip flow increase. It was yeah. more of like, yeah. no, th like that model, is model that's, rate. That's, than, you're totally that's right. Like, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That was not in there, but but that's you are absolutely right. Um, especially once we do have the PRMS doing some comparison between PRMS and what we have from the statistical analysis will be important in then moving into, I think your suggestion of looking at the sensitivity of the model to these inputs and and sort of um, quantifying some of the uncertainty about those inputs um, will be really important. And it would operate much the same way we've done these sens um, sensitivity analysis with other parameters. Yeah. Okay, um, great, thank you. That's, that's, that's not awesome. really, that, that's definitely doable. and. Uh, sh should be possible. And Leland, you do this a lot more than either Claire or I do. Maybe you have an opinion on it. No, but it, it's a good idea. Something to look at. Great. I don't see any other questions and answers or anyone else's hands raised. If you are uh, typing in the question and answers, uh, just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll call on you. You could ask it through that. Else, I think we are starting to get towards the end of the questions. And, oh, we have a hand up. Uh, Eli. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, I, maybe I, I missed it, but is there a, a, a timeline, an estimated timeline for when sort of these new model developments, in, in particular that the surface water hydrology for the tributaries, is there an estimate of when that stuff will be sort of, you know, officially incorporated into the model and available for public review and, and that kind of stuff? I feel like I'm supposed to answer this one. That, that's a little bit asking me like when my PhD is going to be done, which is a Painful question. Uh, but... <laughs> <Just> <laughs> I, I guess like... related to that, is it like, will there just be <laughs> one new version of the model coming out, you know, in the next several years, like, as you say, as you finish your PhD, or is it more like new things will kind of be added in in, in, in batches? Well, I think that it's probably about how, how useful they end up being. So if maybe we add some data and it doesn't actually make the model a better predictor, Maybe we won't roll that all out. Maybe that's a, a side project and we'll have to discuss what to do about that. Um, but I, I I believe it will be a uh, rolling kind of thing where we, we keep kind of updating the model in different ways and doing our best to recalibrate a bit and, and move on from there. Um, but okay. So it sounds like there's nothing coming out in the next like few months, say, or time. No. 
Okay. I don't think so. We're trying to get we're trying to get Leland to be done by sometime <laughs> next year. Okay, thank you. But That's, he's yeah, already I mean answer. he's put together a number of pieces already in the model that have been done. Um, he's moved the model from where the inflow to these tributaries from the upper watersheds aren't monthly averages, but they're actually daily, the daily totals. And so that allows us to run the surface water part of this model, essentially um, with daily varying inf you know, in inflows to the system, which is what's also coming off of the PRMS model. And that's going to be a major improvement, in especially in capturing some of the fast reconnections that happen in falls with a lot of precipitation, we hope. Um, he's done some work on the, the drain flow piece. Um, Claire and Leland have, um, as Leland pointed out, um, put together a package that which should make it much easier to develop some of these scenarios, especially to the degree they evolve, involve land use and land use changes, um, and rather than sort of having to hardwire all these changes into the code they're basically being read off of a table uh, that has all these 2,200 some fields um, and all the 33 years individual months um, in a table and, and things get parameterized from there. Um, yeah, but the, the bigger work in terms of re-parameterizing hydraulic connectivity from these AEM flights um, and then having data available on when streams are wet and dry and looking at some of these more uh, the recent reconnection events we've had over the last three years in more detail as a way to see whether we can get a better understanding of why the dynamics of these reconnections can be so different and what drives these different dynamics and being able to calibrate the model to these events um, in a succinct way will help us answer some of these questions that's going to be work that um, I hope we can have some definitive answers by um, middle of next year. Uh, and hopefully Leland will be done with his PhD by the end of academic year 24, 25. No pressure. Um, and as we're going towards that goal, we will have intermediate results uh, to present for sure. Craig. So, you know, we do a very similar kind of exercise using a hydraulic drip model on the main stem Klamath, trying to figure out the irrigation plan for the Klamath irrigation project and how much water is in Upper Klamath Lake, how much is in the river, all that kind of stuff. In some ways, it's uh, more complicated than this. In some ways, it's simpler. It, the one way it's simpler is there's... Um, you know, a couple of major points of diversion from the river, from Upper Klamath Lake that sort of dictate the agricultural allocation as opposed to in the Scott where there's tons of straws in the river and in the ground all over the place. My question is, can you, what we can do on the Klamath is we can tell the model, hold, we want the lake at this level throughout the year. We want the river flows to have a minimum of this at various points of the year, and then ask the model to tell us what does that do for ag deliveries? Can you do that? It's kind of like asking you to run the model backwards. Is, does this model accommodate that kind of question? That's more of an allocation model, which is the way that that's the water allocation is built into this model is that uh, it's driven by plant water demand and perfect farmer foresight in terms of allocating irrigation amounts. So it, it, it does not account for any, it, right, currently, no, that's not built in. You, you could impose um, water use limitations in a different input file, but uh, currently there's no way of setting, uh, yes, I guess, I guess that would effectively do that. If you set in water limitations on surface water use or on groundwater use, it would tell you it, it would tell you how it affected the flow, but um, nothing formal like that has been implemented. So you, but I mean you, you can specify that there should be this much water at the Fort Jones gauge. Specify, and then, 
I think you have to like let the model run its course, right? Like, you no, because you, you just said it as the in-stream flow requirement. You would say it has to be this much. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you could say on the days when it falls below that, you can't divert. What you're saying, right? But then it's a little circular because then you're affecting the Fort Jones flow, and the one that you based it on is the historical version. So there is still some circularity there. But but yes, I think it, it, it's a. Uh, okay we can we can discuss further currently that's not like an obvious you have to ha you have to do some work around to get to that if i'm understanding correctly but thomas or leland might have a different answer here i don't see why we can't do what if scenarios but i do admit so there is a, a weep model of, of right uh, there, there's Scott another Valley. component well, to try to do this it seems like an obvious scenario to run to tell it to hold the river at the 2017 um proposed flows and see what the the res result is for ag deliveries or ag use so at the 2017 proposed flows there there is one answer to that question which is if you went full unimpaired flow at least according to some assumptions we've made in in developing that it it would not meet the 2017 in stream flows all of the time so it, I don't. I, I think it. If it fully curtailed all of ag, it would not achieve those flows on 100% of days in the 28-year model run. Right, but it'd be so nice holding that cast, flow would not would not necessarily be possible. It would be nice to hindcast that and look year by year and kind of understand what what that looks like. Yeah. So that that attribution scenario is what we call it. That's in the catalog of like turn off all agriculture, replace it all with native vegetation. And no, so you not can turn off all the ag, turn, just holding the river at the 2017 proposal, hind casting that and just seeing, you know, how much ag used in those years. I guess what so I'm trying to say is that the, the, the model set up, right? To do that, you would have to have a series of like, which curtailments would affect which people. You could mm -hmm. cut everything the same. But it, it, it would be difficult to hindcast in, in a way and say this much curtailment would produce the Fort Jones flow. Like we would have to run the model a bunch of times to get to map that, is, I guess, is what I'm saying. We don't have a, a built in feedback between hold the river at this level and what that means for water use. Currently, it only goes in one direction. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Excuse it's me, not Dr. Harder. Uh, may, I yeah. may I chime in just really quick? Sure. Uh, well, I think at, as, as Dr. Chalmers of SCI mentioned here, uh, and to answer that question of yours, Craig, we need to combine this hydrogen model with a water allocation model, and uh, they're going to work together to, I mean, that water allocation model is a WEEP model. I mean, it's called WEEP, and it's... Uh, it looks at uh, different water rights um, uh, through uh, the watershed as well as their priorities and their demands and everything, the maximum diversion that they can uh, have based on their water rights. And it gets uh, the hydrology from the stream model plus stream plus PRMS model. So those kind of uh, scenarios, which are really important to have the answers for, are a part of our um, project effort uh, of developing that VEEP model and completing, I, I mean, those kind of water allocation scenarios using the VEEP model. We are planning to have uh, another uh, kind of webinar or workshop in next few months, specifically on that water allocation VEEP model. Thanks, Shahab. And going back to your question in terms of you know, forcing a model backwards from the in-stream flow requirement. WEEP does that, It's but even WEEP doesn't work entirely backwards from setting, saying here's the, here's the in-stream flow requirement for the Fortunes gauge, whether that's 2017 or the 2021 emergency flow table, could be either one of them. Then um, it, the model isn't structured to where that's being set as a model input. And then the model output is what happens with with agriculture. It's always that things 
change on the agricultural side, on the irrigation side, and who gets to divert water, who gets to pump water. And then we look at what happens to the Fort Jones gauge. And so it becomes an iterative process. If it's not enough happening at a Fort Jones gauge, you rerun the model with a new set of rules that are that are tighter until you get to the place where the Fort Jones gauge meets these meets meets these flows. Right. It would be an it would have to be an iterative approach. Yeah. But and one one thing that we do see from one thing that we do see from these attribution scenarios is in most in it's going to be it, it'll be different depending on what we do with the agricultural landscape and this might be different i, I don't know enough about the upper climate face and agricultural system um and how it's connected to the subsurface with the klamath river um but in the in scott valley we have this fairly tight interplay between agriculture, groundwater, and surface water. And we can, because agriculture is part of this, um, it's not just that we have an outlet from the stream and agriculture is over there and either agriculture takes that water out or not. Um, there's a feedback loop. Um, and then if, if agriculture never, was to take any water, either surface water or groundwater, because stream flows are being aren't being met, then in a realistic scenario, we we would have to replace agriculture. And that's kind of what we did. What that's essentially what happened with the unimpaired scenarios. If we take an unimpaired scenario and we then parameterize the vegetation that is there in terms of how much ET it does and its capability to fetch or wick groundwater to its roots and fetch that. Um, depending on how we parameterize that, in many years, the 2017 targets are still not met, is what Claire was saying. There are, there are more years in which the 2017 targets are met in the summer, but there's many years where they are not met. Um, and so if you had a model that could work, it, your, you know, the way you describe it, where you set that flow and then see what happens, there would be many years where the model wouldn't have a solution because there's no way to get it unless we allowed the model to build reservoirs on its own. Well, not reservoirs, man. Wetlands and, and beaver ponds, not reservoirs. <laughs> I mean, I think one right. reason why the model doesn't get yeah. to the answer to my question very well is it it presumes the anthropogenic changes that we've engineered on the on the system will always persist. Remain. So that's yeah. what I'm trying to get to. Like maybe we would yeah. actually fix yeah. it, you know, instead yeah. of just just cutting off ag is not going to do it. We're going to have to, you know, manage agricultural use and do these significant physical alterations to the valley. Right. So the way we, we will get to that is by doing, seeing that we can implement some of these scenarios and understand what improvements we can capture from those in terms of stream flow and then work that way forward. Mm -hmm. Doug, thank Doug you for was, chiming in as well. Yeah, I think Doug was next and then I think we have one other hand from Sarah. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, if I can chime in here. Um, so, Craig, I think, um, so I'm, I'm working with uh, SCI and we're working on developing a WEEP model, which basically is a water allocation model. And it kind of does perform as uh, a water master and, and it performs curtailments based on priority. And you can pretty directly put in a, in-stream flow target at the Fort Jones gauge, and you could set the priority to anything you want to. So you could set the in-stream flow target to have the highest priority in the basin. And then that, that as you're saying, would kind of force the model to work backwards to see, okay, I know that I need to fulfill that flow requirement, and then whatever other deliveries happen, happen. It's not perfect, of course, because um, it does rely, it connects to, um, the SFIM model. So that's where we take our crop demands from. Um, and so some of the groundwater connections might kind of be 
more static than we want in the weep model. But that, that's how we're exploring that. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Sarah. Was next. Oh, I think, yeah, go for it. You should be able to unmute now, Sarah. Okay. Um, I'm not a hydrologist, <laughs> um, but I I hear quoted quite frequently that um, the the 2017 scenario that no matter if if there's no agricultural diversions, no agricultural pumping, that flows wouldn't be met, and that's something that's being parroted around the valley mm -hmm. quite a bit, and it doesn't make it it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make ecological sense. It doesn't make evolutionary sense. I I can't imagine that the um, the changes that have happened in the river have been so much that that um, biologic opinions on what is necessary for fish flows would not be met if there was no diversion or pumping. And I'm wondering about that. Is that is that where the changes like beaver dams and that sort of thing come in? I mean, did did it make that big of a difference in our watershed, or or can you can you comment on that? Yeah, I think that's what uh, what Craig's hypothesis is as well. Is that if we were to put in beaver dams and floodplain reconnection into the model, and some of these reworkings that in fact um, there would be uh, the ability of the system to meet these 2017 flows, perhaps even with ag agricultural irrigation, at least some of the time or, uh, and, or, and or some of the years. And so that, I think your point is well taken, Sarah, and I think you're, you're understanding exactly what Craig is suggesting. Um, and also sort of the, the implications of what our current model results in the report that we just published are showing um, and the contradiction between those. And that's something that will be an important component of, uh, of the scenarios, the, the new scenarios that we're creating in, in terms of looking at what is possible under these different management options that are out there in uh, recreating a healthier ecosystem. I I would just, I, I Thomas, that's well put. I would just add that um, the finding that maybe is being thrown around, like you said, I would add some nuance to the, the scenario of turn off all ag water use makes several assumptions about the type of vegetation that would establish in the absence of agriculture, which would still you know, involve some ET. Um, so it, it's not like we would be paving over the valley and seeing how that would affect the flows. It's it's this it's this sor sort of unimaginable land use change. Um, and uh, as Thomas said, in that scenario, the flows are met in some years, and certainly in more, in far more than the base case. Um, so it's it's not like there's zero improvement due to this drastic land use change. Uh, in this like sort of scenario that we drafted to put air like to bracket what human influence is causing in this current arrangement. Um, that said, the I think it does highlight that the variability in the system is really high, and that the um, the low flows in some years uh, remain below this this regime that was drafted in 2017 or for 2017 in some of the time. So so the, the idea, what I was trying to get at is the idea of holding the river at the 2017 flows under our current understanding of what is taking place might be physically impossible because it, at least at some point in the 28 year period, I think it would fall below that threshold. But that's not to say that the rest of the time the flows wouldn't be much improved or yeah, it, does that does that make, does that nuance a little bit more helpful or does that still not uh does that answer your question no, it's yeah it that is helpful yes it is um yeah it is i it's 
it's shocking how much um, change has occurred on the river and um and you know you're speaking of reservoirs there used to be a natural reservoir um to just before the gauge and uh that would that was blasted out and i wonder you know what kind of impact that had on the system as a whole as well and and um definitely on coho habitat so um but it's 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 we've got a lot of work to do in the river that's what it just shows to me we've got a lot of work to do and in the tribs and um and making them more accessible and passable and uh it gives it it yeah it's a lot of work <laughs> i feel overwhelmed <laughs> Zach, I, I do have to run pretty soon here. Um, yeah, and I was going to just quickly comment on Verna's question about whether natural vegetation scenarios, the only, whether in, in vegetation scenarios, the only parameter change is the ET, suggesting that maybe there's no relationship to natural recharge. The ET, so we represent the natural vegetation um, through its rooting depth the depth to which it can actually wick water to the roots in addition to the rooting depth and the potential ET demand that could come from that natural vegetation if the water table, if there's enough soil moisture and or the water table is uh, close enough to the roots where they can fetch some or all of their ET needs. That is the key driver um, that we set up in the model, but then that has repercussions that are represented in the model properly on the amount of recharge. If there, there's vegetation that picks up soil moisture from precipitation, um, that's recharge, that's water that's not being recharged and that's that's reflected intrinsically in the model. So yes, the natural recharge um, is being impacted by the type of vegetation that uh, we put into the model, whether that's crops, specific crops or whether that's specific vegetation. Um, and then that's also directly playing with the uh, soil properties, which vary from each between each of these 2,200 fields, depending on where in the soil map they are. I hope that answered that question. Well, great. That is a, uh the end of the time that we had set, I don't see any other questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say we should be wrapping up. Um, I do just want to thank UC Davis for being on and, and going over this. This was a great thing. And to all the attendees who, who stayed on and listened, um, we will be, once we have the recording ready, we will be posting it to the Scott Shasta drought webpage, and we will send a follow-up email letting you guys know when that is available. And along with that notice, we will also include a uh, the emails as far as further questions you may have for SVIM and who you should be pointing those to. So once again, I just want to thank everyone for participating and a special thanks to UC Davis for the wonderful presentation. Thank you all for being here. And thanks to Leland and Claire for doing a terrific job. All right. All right. Everyone have a nice night. Thank you again.